It was another perfect late summer day when I jumped over the edge of a huge bucket and ran unsteadily towards the nearest toilet. I walked around the man and his young son, who were standing in the doorway, deep in conversation about whether the boy needed to go to the toilet. Approaching them from my corner, I already saw something that the boy's father did not see. The reason his child no longer needed to go to the toilet was because, judging by the stain on the back of his shorts, he had already gone. Sorry, I said, walking past them with one hand on my mouth and the other on my stomach. Luckily, I was alone in the room, and what's even better is that my stomach calmed down before I started feeling sick. I stood in front of the mirror wondering why I was such a coward. Why did I allow myself to be drawn into something that I knew scared me, not just once, but over and over again? Before the question was even posed, I answered myself. Love. I did it for love. Okay, there was a little passion, but I really love Penny. Or at least he did back then. Damn, there was nothing I didn't like about her. She had rich, beautiful, brown hair, smoky brown eyes, and a smile that lit up any room she was in. She was skinny but curved, with the sweetest, toned ass imaginable and breasts that should have been on a much larger girl. Penny probably could have had any guy she wanted, but for some reason she seemed to want me. Me, plain old Greg Stevens. As usual, we spent my day off at Great Lakes Adventures. Penny loved roller coasters and all sorts of extreme rides, so we went on a lot of them. After I felt better, I walked out of the restroom to find Penny, her sister Julie, and her best friend Rebecca, who for some reason was called Bucket, waiting for me. What are we going to ride next, dear? Penny smiled. Anything that makes you happy, honey, I said. Greg, can we get something to eat? Julie asked, looking at me. We've been on rides all day, and I'm getting a little hungry. Damn it, Julie, Penny said sharply. We can eat when we get home. It's quite a drive here, and the only day we can come is Greg's day off. It'll be dark soon. We'll buy food, and you can eat it in the car. I took money out of my pocket for the next trip. I handed them to Penny, and she kissed me. It's not enough for all of us, she said. I know, honey, I told her. But I promised your parents I'd make sure Julie had a good time. You and Bucket go on the roller coaster again, and I'll take Julie and find her something to eat. Greg, you don't have to give in to her whining, she said. I know. But one day, hopefully soon, she will become my daughter-in-law, I said. Count on it, Penny said, kissing me again. Once we get off the roller coaster, I'll meet you at the exit. She and Bucket walked away from us, heading to the next extreme ride they could try. There was something about Penny that I didn't share. Penny was very adventurous and seemed to go from one thrill to another. She loved all the scary rides, scary movies, and anything that involved risk. Thank you, Julie, I said, watching her sister walk away from us. Anytime, future brother-in-law, she smiled. Julie was as different from Penny as two sisters who share the DNA of both parents could be different. While Penny's hair is, as mentioned, a rich brown, Julie's hair is blonde. Penny cuts her hair short because it's convenient. Julie's hair goes down to the middle of her back. They both have the same smoky brown eyes, but Penny's eyes seem smaller, like their father's, and Julie's have large, innocent eyes, like their mother's. You'd think my sister would realize that you're afraid of heights and stop making you go on those rides. I mean, it's none of my business, but considering how much she says she loves you, she really doesn't treat you very well, she said. Well, she's young, I said. I guess when she has the opportunity, she just likes to get out and experience something. Greg, I'm young too, Julie said. I'm 19. Penny is 22. It's selfish that she's like this, and you spoil her. She chases cheap thrills, regardless of the consequences for anyone else. She's always been like this, even when we were little. One day, her cheap sensations will cost her more than she is willing to pay. What do you want to eat? I asked to defuse the situation. Whatever, Greg, she said, smiling at me. I'm not very hungry, 
but I better eat something now because I know you won't let me eat anything in your Mustang. I thought about how a little sister can sometimes be so much more mature as we wandered around looking for something to eat. How do you always get the good guys? asked my best friend Bucket as we walked back to the roller coaster. I was so angry that I almost missed her question. Two reasons, I said, smiling. Nice guys don't marry sluts, that's one reason. And the second is because of balance. What balance are you talking about? Bucket asked. And in general, it's not nice to call me a slut. I meant that in the best sense of the word, Beck, I smiled. And you're lucky. You don't have to drag your annoying little sister around with you everywhere, I said. And your parents don't bother you every day about trifles. They just show they care, Becky grinned. Why don't they take care of me from a distance, I said. Or better yet, why don't they be like your parents and just stay out of my affairs? I'm 22 years old, not four. My life is already planned out. Julie should get good grades in school. She'll be a career woman. These two years, the colleges I went to were the worst two years of my damn life and a big waste of time. I don't need college to be a housewife. We joined the shortest line we could find for any roller coaster. Then I have to listen to them ask me why I don't have a damn job like Julie. Julie needs a job because after college she's going into the workforce. I'm just going to marry Greg and sit around having kids. There will be many beautiful, smart, and hard-working children like him, and beautiful ones like me. Well, my contribution to society is complete, I said. Becky smiled as she listened to my tirade. She had heard this more than once. Well, you seem to have everything planned and everything looks promising, she said with a smile. Just a question. I looked at her suspiciously because Beck could be quite sarcastic. If you're going to be a housewife, then... She started before I interrupted her. There's no such thing as just a housewife, I replied sharply. Homemakers. Home engineers are the pillars of American society. They are the main pillar that supports the family unit. As a woman and a feminist, I make a choice and I choose to stay home and make sure my children are raised properly. Okay, Oprah, she grinned. Can I finish my question? I nodded to her again, but was wary. Why don't you get a job while you don't have kids? She asked. I just growled at her. Or how about this? She stepped back a little, moving out from under my hand. If you're going to be that great home engineer, why don't you start practicing and preparing for your career by helping around the house. Your room looks like a pigsty. Well, bitch, I said, swinging at her and missing. That's because, firstly, the house I'm living in right now is not my home. And secondly, because I'm sure Greg will make enough money so that we can afford to hire a maid for all this boring nonsense. I completely agree. Damn boring nonsense, said a voice behind us. I turned around and noticed three guys behind us. Hey, beautiful, said the tallest and most muscular of them. I looked at him at the same moment as he looked at me. I stuck my chest out a little so he could see what he would never get. How many tickets do you have? He asked. He was dirty. There were even traces of dirt on his face, like a naughty boy. And his face, his features were no more beautiful than Greg's, but he looked more wild. His hair was not styled. He was wearing a dirty t-shirt and his pants still had holes in the knees, like it was still the 90s. But there was something primal about him. And looking at him, you could tell that he knew it. Why are you interested in this? I asked. Well, because these slides aren't as steep as those ones, he pointed out. And those are half the price. So if we go there, all four of us can ride on your tickets. I just looked at him. Why should I pay for you and your friend to go on a roller coaster? I asked. Because it's no fun riding alone, he snapped. Do you really want everyone in this park to think that you can't find a boyfriend? Besides, he spread his arms and looked around. Meeting new people and doing something interesting is always fun, right? Have you ever been on a roller coaster with your arms in the air the whole way? I bet as soon as we get going... You'll be clutching the rail like a baby holding a bottle. His mockery got to me. 
I won't catch it, I said, sounding incredibly childish. Prove it, he said. Bucket and I left the line and stood in another with him and his friend. I noticed that one of the guys didn't line up with us. The guy who spoke to me was named Brett. His friend who didn't tell me was Ronnie. I never recognized the third guy by name. I gave the man who ran the ride our tickets, and we began to board the roller coaster car. As soon as I sat down, Brett jumped in front of the bucket and sat down next to me. Bucket sat down next to Ronnie. I noticed his third friend had a camera. When he took the photo, I turned my head away. It's unusual, Brett said. A beautiful girl who isn't so self-obsessed that she always wants to be photographed. It's not that unusual, I said. I have a boyfriend who would probably be upset if he saw pictures of me on a roller coaster with another guy. Being upset with me would only cause him pain, Brett said. I do martial arts. I've never lost a fight. Just hearing this, for some reason, made me feel excited. The trailer began to move, and the anticipation of what would soon happen pierced me. Damn, we haven't even started yet, and you're already holding on to the handrail like a life preserver, Brett snapped. I looked at my hands and raised them up as the trailer slowly climbed the first hill. The view was amazing as the trailer rose higher and higher and the distance between us and the ground increased. I stubbornly refused to grab the handrail, and the excitement I usually felt in anticipation of my first big descent intensified. Suddenly the carriage hung on the rails for a moment, beginning its descent, and the speed increased sharply. With increased speed came my need for increased security. I wanted to grab the handrail, but I didn't want to give him pleasure. I held my hands in the air, and it felt wonderful. The speed at which we raced along the tracks created a breeze that whipped my hair wildly as we thundered down the track and closer to the loop. My eyes were wide, and I screamed as we reached the bottom of the hill and began to climb. Then I felt them. I looked down and Brett was grabbing my chest. I don't know why I didn't say anything. Maybe because I was upside down and not holding on to anything when the trailer flew through the loop. Maybe because the combination of thrill and fear overloaded my mind and left me open to other things. But before I could tell him that I'm not the type of girl who allows men other than her boyfriend to touch her, I was him. As the car rolled along the track to pick up speed and went through a series of turns, I moved his hands and said, No, I have a boyfriend. He looked at me as if my words meant nothing, but removed his hands. I looked behind me to see if Bucket had noticed anything, but she wasn't herself. Her head was thrown back, her eyes were closed, and she was too caught up in what Ronnie was doing to her to care what I was or wasn't doing. See, your friend knows how to have fun, Brett said with disappointment. My friend is not going to get married, I said. She's a slut and everyone knows it. I think she's just a woman who knows how to relax and have fun, he said. We were both silent for a few minutes. The trailer then made a series of hills that gradually got larger, preparing us for one last huge hill and another even bigger loop. As the trailer raced down the last huge drop, Brett made his move. I almost expected this. His fingers slid into my jeans and passed my panty line. No, I said. I do not want it. Then why does your warmth say otherwise, he asked. And he was right. I don't think it was Brett. In fact, I was not interested in him, and I could easily ignore this kind of animal attraction. But the fact is that I loved the feeling of danger from big, fast rides, and when that feeling was added to the thought of illicit sex, I felt a feeling I had never felt before. Don't worry, he'll never know, Brett said. That was the end of the conversation as we burst into the final loop. As soon as we left the loop, I wanted to pull his hands away but I just couldn't stop, and he knew it. Almost before the trailer stopped, I tried to get out of it and move away from it. I looked back and saw him laughing. I found my cranky sister and Greg and rushed to them as quickly as possible. I hugged Greg and started kissing him, as if that would somehow make my guilt go away. We drove home. I held his hand the whole way. First we left the bucket and then drove to my house. 
My sister slowly got out of the car. She thanked Greg about ten times and just didn't leave. Um, Julie, I said loudly. Don't you think I could use a few minutes alone with my boyfriend? You've been dominating him for the last half hour. We were at the park. Julie looked at me strangely and nodded her head. I still have to go, Greg said. I have to go to work early tomorrow. He kissed me. It was a really good kiss. If Julie hadn't been standing there, I would have taken him behind the house and had sex with him right there on the grass. It was dark outside and no one would have seen us. My knees went weak as he kissed me. But the most important thing was that I realized then that it made me feel even more ashamed of what I had done. What made his kisses so powerful was the loving feeling I got from them. Every kiss told me that this man loved me. They told me that he would do anything in the world for me, and they made me feel dizzy. It wasn't the kind of dizziness you get from riding a roller coaster with your arms in the air. It was a stronger, more significant dizziness that stayed with you long after the ride or the kissing was over. Dizzy, I dreamed. I saw Greg and myself in a beautiful house with two small children running around. The kids were running all over the yard, and finally a little girl came up and said to Greg, Daddy, Mommy loves you, and so do I. Are you okay, Penny? Greg asked, snapping me out of my daydream. He smiled, and my sister looked at me strangely. Her lips were pressed into a straight line, and she was angry for some reason. It's probably not that strange that a little sister likes her older sister's boyfriend. I'm fine, honey, I said. You just take me away every time you kiss me. He smiled. Ah, oh damn, that was too sentimental. Julie went into the house singing, Take My Breath Away, by Berlin from the movie Top Gun. Greg gave me one last wave and got into his Mustang to drive away. I walked into the house floating on a cloud, not realizing that my life was about to change. Just as I was walking into my room and laying down on my bed to think about what had happened, Julie walked past me on her way to the bathroom to shower. She shook her head as she walked past, and I laughed. My sister stopped and came into my room. Listen, today is the only time I'll have your back, she said. Greg is too good a guy for you to deceive him like that. Are you jealous, little sister? I chuckled. If I was jealous, I wouldn't distract him, and you'd probably be walking here from Ohio right now, she snorted. Suddenly, I looked at Julie and realized that she was not just my capricious little sister. She was also a grown woman, and she was really angry with me. What are you babbling about? I asked. It's really stupid for a woman who thinks she's going to get married to let another guy grope her tits on a roller coaster while her boyfriend is sitting in the food court right below her where he could see her, she said. Then she just rolled her eyes at me and went to the bathroom to shower. Before I could do anything, my phone rang. I smiled, thinking everything was fine. Greg always called me right before he went to bed and again first thing in the morning. He always said that he wanted my voice to be the last one he heard before he went to sleep and the first one he heard every morning. Hi, honey, I said, wrapping myself in the blanket. I wish you were here in bed with me. I would show you how much I love you. Damn, Penny. We've known each other since we were eight, and I never knew you liked women. If I knew, we wouldn't need guys. Damn, I'm willing to try anything, especially because I know that you love me, Becky said. Bucket, I sighed. I thought it was Greg. Of course you thought so, Becky chuckled. Do you want me to come right now so you can show me how much you love me? What do you want, I said kindly. Hurry. Greg will call me soon. Those two guys we met in the park want to meet us, she said enthusiastically. How did you know that? I asked. I gave Ronnie my number and he texted me, she said. Then he called me and we talked. I'm going to do it and I need you to come with me. Becky, that's why you can't keep a guy, I said. As soon as another one appears, your head turns so fast that it looks like it's going to fly off. What about Jason? I asked. You told me this morning that you thought he might be the one. I'm not a very good thinker, she said, laughing. I have everything figured out, 
and my plan will work for you too. First, tomorrow morning, I will call Jason. I will be sweet and angelic, but then I will start arguing with him and break things off with him. Then we can meet the guys, and if this won't be great, I'll call Jason back or just try to run into him later, I'll get back together with him. And if he ever finds out, I'll just tell him it happened while we weren't together, you could do that same thing. I would never do that to Greg, I said. Besides, Greg isn't stupid enough to believe something like that. I could lose him. Then don't do anything. Just come with me to make sure things don't get out of hand, she said. What do you mean, I asked. Well, there are three of them, she said. I may not be able to handle all three. The next morning I woke up and immediately called Penny. She didn't answer the phone, which told me she was still asleep. After all the excitement at the theme park yesterday, I expected her to sleep longer. I left a message saying I loved her and went to work. My morning went as usual, completing reports, processing invoices, and making details or minor changes to drawings. But towards the end of the morning, my boss called me into the office and asked me if I was good at Master Cam. I assured him that it was, and he gave me a support bracket that had come off one of our client's cars. This bracket needed to be replaced. Since these brackets were quite common and often broken, my boss decided that we should make them ourselves instead of spending the time and money ordering them from a manufacturer. He wanted me to reverse engineer the bracket, make it a little stronger, and then draw up plans for a new bracket. I was over the moon. At lunchtime, I walked into a jewelry store in a shopping center with my chest puffed out proudly. Julie, my girlfriend's younger sister, walked up to me. Hi, Greg, she smiled. Do you want to take another look at it or just make another contribution? I'll just make a contribution, I said. But with the bonus my boss is promising me for the job I'm working on, I might be able to pick it up sooner. Julie just shook her head. I hope my stupid sister realizes how lucky she is, she said. I gave her the money and she gave me an updated receipt that showed how much I still owed on the ring. She called her boss and handed him the money. Greg, do you want to just take the ring with you? He asked. You only have $300 left to pay. Thank you, Mr. Burton, I said. But I haven't proposed to her yet. She might say no. He just looked at me and laughed. She'd be crazy to say no. He called a woman working on the other side of the store. When she came and looked at us, he began to talk to her. Helena, he said, if Penny decides not to marry Greg, will you take her place and marry him? His daughter looked at me and immediately smiled and nodded her head. She'll have to get in line behind me, Julie laughed. I felt pretty good as I left the store and headed back to work. Becky kept her word. She carried out her stupid plan. She broke up with Jason, and I swear I don't understand it. Neither of us were virgins, but Becky was just a slut. That's why it was called The Bucket. I thought what she did was stupid. Jason grew up and went through school with us, and he was the only decent guy in town who dealt with her. He was the only guy I knew who tried to see past her reputation for the real Becky. Becky was a complex woman. She could be the most caring and sensitive person in the world. She would never harm a fly and always volunteered to help on any occasion that could be named. What she really wanted, like me, was to find a man who loved her and get a job so she wouldn't have to work all those ten-hour shifts as a waitress at a diner for sub-minimum wage. But at the same time, Becky had no complexes. She would literally have fun with any guy who just offered her sex. She doesn't care what they look like. We met them in a park near my house. There were many secluded places in the park. It was early in the morning because Becky had to go to a late shift at the diner, and I wanted to get this done before Greg got home from work. They pulled up in a beat-up pickup truck that had seen better days. Ronnie was driving, and he immediately approached Becky. Brett came out and approached me. I didn't talk to him or even look at him. So, will it be like this? He laughed. Ronnie, she's playing hard to get. Ronnie didn't pay attention to him. He whispered in Becky's ear 
and she smiled like it was Christmas. She grabbed his hand and led him into the bushes. The third guy seemed to follow them. I was glad she started quickly. The sooner she finishes, the sooner I can get away from them. I knew Becky wouldn't stay with Ronnie Long. Less than a minute later, I heard Becky moaning from behind the bushes. Hey, do you want to see something? Brett asked. No, I answered. He held his phone up to my face anyway. Looks like you were having a good time, he said. He leafed through the photographs. The first few were pictures of us on the roller coaster yesterday. The next few showed me with my hands in the air and him holding my chest. Suddenly, I understood why there was a third guy. As I looked, the next pictures showed Brett with his hand in my panties. Why are you showing me this? I asked. My stupid friend took this footage on his iPhone, Brett said. I think I should get him to remove them, shouldn't I? I won't give you a penny, I said. I have an uncle who is a policeman. He will deal with this blackmail, and you and your two stupid friends will go to jail. I'm on your side, fool, he said. I don't want this to come out either, and I don't need your money. How much can you even give me? I listened to you yesterday, so I know you don't even have a job. Just if I'm going to risk losing a friend, I don't want to do this in vain. I thought you didn't want money, I answered sharply. I didn't say anything about money, he said. Besides, he's probably already posting it on his Facebook page. He has over a thousand friends. We only live two towns away. A lot of his friends live here. You never know who might see it. All it takes is one person, who you know. That person will tell another, and they will tell two others, and the next moment you're without a boyfriend. What do you want, asshole? I asked. The pleasures are below the belt, he said. Go to hell, I blurted out. Okay, he said. Hey, don't worry about it. It's your choice. These are really good photos. You're a really beautiful girl. We'll get a lot of views. Let's go, I said. Where, he asked. Into the bushes so you can get what you want, I said. But give me the phone first. I'll delete the photos and return it after we're done. Nope, he said. I'm not going to beg you to do it, I said sharply. Let's go or forget about it. Here and now, he said. What? I asked. I know you, Penny, he said. You like danger more than what you're actually doing. You need adrenaline. In this case, it would be the adrenaline of getting caught. Now go ahead and get to work. I just looked at him. I don't. I started. The longer you wait, the more likely it is that someone will see you, he said. I knelt down and pulled his pants down to his ankles. I can't even begin to describe how humiliating it was to do something so personal to someone I hated as much as Brett. At the same time, he was right. The chance of being caught added spice. I imagined bringing Greg here and doing something like that. Before I realized what was happening, we were already having sex. I wish I could say it was worth the risk, but it wasn't. Greg and I would sometimes get a motel room since we were both still living with our parents, and the sex wasn't nearly as good as it was with Greg. At least I didn't feel that suffocating feeling of guilt with Greg because I knew we belonged together. Becky and Ronnie ran out of the bushes, adjusting their clothes to see what was happening. Damn, girl, I can't believe you did that, Becky said, shaking her head. What if someone saw you? I lowered my skirt and looked at Brett with venom in my eyes. I grabbed my phone and deleted the video and all the photos. I handed the phone back to Brett. Are these the only copies? I asked. He simply grinned and nodded at me. It was really good, he said. I'm glad you liked it, I said furiously. This will never happen again. He just started laughing. He and his friends headed to the truck. As he jumped onto the back of the truck, he waved to me and said, See you tomorrow. I gave him the middle finger and then turned around and hit Becky hard. What is this for? She complained. Looks like you had a good time. Oh, you think me cheating on my future husband was funny? I asked loudly. That idiot blackmailed me. He made me do it. 
Oh, Ronnie didn't blackmail me, Becky said. I can't believe you willingly had sex with these guys, I said. Which guys, she asked. It was only Ronnie. Where was the other guy, I asked. I don't know, but he wasn't with us, she said. I think I'll get back to Jason tomorrow, maybe even tonight, so we don't have to repeat this. We went home. As soon as I got home, I headed to the shower. I seemed to be cleaning myself inside and out for over an hour, and it felt like I couldn't get clean. Then I lay down in my bed and started crying. I swore I would never do anything like that again. I also blamed Greg for what happened to me. If he had gone on the roller coaster with me, none of this would have happened. Greg knew me better than anyone. He knew that I liked risky sensations. If he loved me as much as he claimed, he should have been willing to do this to me. Greg avoided roller coasters every chance he got. It was his fault. As I sat lost in thought, my thoughts were suddenly interrupted by a loud slam of my door. My brain refused to process what was happening. Then, as the shock wore off, I noticed Julie standing in front of me. Her chest rose and fell. I don't know why I never noticed that Julie's breasts were at least a size larger than mine. She was a couple of inches shorter than me and smaller than me in everything except her breast. Julie definitely inherited our mom's amazing figure, in addition to those angelic, innocent eyes. What's your problem, Julie? I screamed at her. After the morning I'd had, I wasn't in the mood for her problems. You're a fucking bitch, she screamed. How could you be so stupid? Listen, Julie, if you have something to say, just say it, I said sharply. I'm not in the mood for 20 questions. Do you know Jason Daniels? Julie asked. Of course I know, I said. We grew up together. He's Becky's boyfriend. He's a good guy. He's not Becky's boyfriend anymore, Julie said. He just hit her in the middle of town. She walked up to him and started talking to him in front of the diner where she works. Looks like Becky tried to do what she usually does when she breaks up with a relationship and then goes and has fun with another guy, one time too many. Jason followed her today and watched her. When the police came to ask him what was going on, Jason laid it all out. Right on the street, he told them about how she had sex with some guy in the park. He also claimed that I was there too. Becky stood up for me. She told them it wasn't me, but someone else. It's not me, I lied. I've been here the whole time. Julie looked at me and just walked out of the room. After a while, Becky called me. She was crying and could barely speak. It turned out that the officer believed Jason's story, at least about Becky. Jason didn't have to face assault charges because the police understood how badly he was hurt and Becky agreed not to press charges against him. The fact that Jason stood there on the street crying in front of everyone, including other men, made Becky realize how much he loved her. What Becky always wanted most, she always had, but she was too stupid to realize it until she lost it. Becky was charged with public indecency and had to pay a huge fine. It was only after hearing this that I realized that I was in the same boat. Bad news travels like light in a small town. I was sure that sooner or later Greg would hear about all this. Then Becky hit me. I'm so sorry, she said. I tried to cover for you. I know, Beck, I said. Thank you. What are you giving thanks for? She asked, still crying. They have a video of you. Jason saw with his own eyes how I went into the bushes with Ronnie, so we have no chance. Over the years he heard about what I do, but since he never saw it, he loved me enough for love to overcome doubt. But this time he saw it with his own eyes. He'll never forgive it, Penny. And if Greg sees that video, he'll never forgive you. Becky, you need to call Ronnie and get him to let me talk to Brett, I said angrily. She quickly pressed a few buttons on her phone and switched it to a three-way call, adding Ronnie. I want to talk to Brett, I said. About what? Ronnie asked. What will you give me if I find it for you? He told me what a good time you had, and maybe I'd like some too. You got your fix from Becky, I said. Getting an overweight girl is too easy, he chuckled. You saw her drag me into the bushes. She loves it. 
She's too accessible. You, on the other hand, Brett said he had to convince you. Always the quiet ones, hard to get. Go to hell, I screamed. That's what I want from you, he grinned. Besides, you'll see Brett again tomorrow, if he can leave his wife. He suddenly stopped talking, realizing he'd made a mistake. For a long time, neither of us spoke. Ronnie, call Brett and give him the phone now, or I swear I'll give your number to my uncle, and he's a cop. They're really wondering what happened in the park today. Nonsense, he said. If you give us away, I'll say that you were there too. Ronnie, the man I want to marry might find out about this, I said coldly. I have to make sure he never sees this tape. I will pay this fine. I have more than that saved up in the bank. Do you have it? Do you and Brett have it? Do I need to follow you and find out who Brett's wife is and create problems in his life like you created in ours? How about I just go to Brett's next MMA fight and tell his wife everything that happened? Ronnie snorted in response. He hung up and Brett called me back ten minutes later. What do you want? he asked mockingly. I want the damn tape, I responded furiously, matching his tone. No copies and no more recordings. In fact, come alone tomorrow morning. Don't bring your devious friend with a camera. I don't want anyone to even know I'm dating you. And why should I bring you the recording, he asked. What's in it for me? Not going to jail would be nice, I said. Maybe you should watch this tape, he said. Everything we did was consensual. What do I need to do to make this end? I asked. Give me some more of what I got this morning, he laughed. Damn, I screamed loudly. This is the last time we see each other, I said. No problem, he replied sharply. I have another one in mind. Aren't you married? I asked. Yes, he said. But I admit it. I accept it. And it has nothing to do with your pathetic life. I'll see you tomorrow morning. And he hung up. What should we do? Becky began. I hung up too. I blamed Becky for a lot of what happened. If she hadn't been so hot with Ronnie and begging me to go with her, I wouldn't be in such trouble. I looked up and saw my sister looking at me like I was an insect. She looked like I should have been scraped off her shoe. So were you really with that guy in the park? She said, shaking her head and you're going to do it again. You're even worse than I thought. You don't deserve him. I'm human and I made a mistake. I like thrills. I loved going on roller coasters, and Greg isn't perfect. If he had gone on the roller coaster with me instead of sticking up for you, none of this would have happened. And where is he all this time? He's always working and leaves me bored and... You must be the dumbest bitch, she laughed. Greg has been on a roller coaster ride with you all day, she said. Didn't you notice how sick he was getting? You followed him into the men's room to talk him into going on that last ride. He wasn't there to take a piss. Penny, Greg has severe acrophobia. He's deathly afraid of heights. He was riding on doing this stuff with you all damn day because he loves you so much. Did you really want to see him throw up just so you could go on another ride that's meant to be fun and mostly for kids? I didn't know, I said. I would never hurt him. I can't believe he did it for me. Why didn't he say anything? Because Greg isn't perfect, she said. I think he's not very sure about you. He sees something really special in you and doesn't want you to think he's weak. As for his job so much, she said. He's trying to make sure he has a great job right out of college so you two don't suffer like so many young couples do. Nonsense. Julie. I replied sharply. I don't care if Greg works his summer internship, but he works a lot more hours than the other interns. Steve only works 20 hours a week. He and Melissa go to the beach with us all the time. Steve probably won't work for a company after graduation like Greg, she said. And also. And what else? I asked sharply. You know something about my boyfriend that I don't. You want him, don't you? Penny, I'm dating Greg's brother, remember, she said softly. And even if I wanted Greg, you're my sister. I would never do that to you. One of us has morals. Then what are you hiding, 
I asked sharply. Julie, I can't stand this. Greg works so hard because he's trying to pay off the two-carat engagement ring he bought you. Almost every cent he made this summer went towards your ring, stupid. Are you satisfied now? And she left the room, leaving me feeling even worse. The next few hours dragged on as if I was waiting for a call from Greg. I called him and left several messages, but he never picked up or called back. This was the first time in our relationship. Usually, even if Greg and I had an argument, he would call back. I felt lonely and empty at that moment and realized what a stupid thing I had done. I knew that sooner or later Greg and I would talk, and I needed to make sure that no copies of that tape were left behind. It was like Becky said, maybe I can get Greg to forgive me for this, but if the recording remains and someone sees it or tells him about it, or God forbid, if he sees it himself, I will have no chance. I considered all the options, and even if I decided to confess to him and hope for his forgiveness, and that in time we could get over this, I needed to destroy the tape. Greg may take a while to get over this, but he loves me, so once everything calms down, we'll be fine. I'll spend the rest of my life trying to make things right. This will never happen again. I must strive for that dream of us that I always see in my thoughts. But if he ever sees this recording, there will be no chance. No man will ever forgive such a woman. If we both stay in this town for the rest of our lives, Greg will never speak to me. Our siblings could marry each other, and he wouldn't even talk to me at their wedding. I had no choice. Greg never called me that night. It was another first. Greg always called me, even before we became a couple. When we were just friends, he called me so much that my mom begged me to meet him so he would stop trying so hard. If someone told him a joke, he would call me and tell it to me, even if it wasn't funny. He was always so eager to share his life with me. I'm such a fool. I went to the park around noon. I told Brett to meet there at half past twelve and not a minute earlier. I wanted to make sure he couldn't bring his friends into the area to take any photos or videos. He came alone and smiled at me as he approached. This time I walked with him further into the forest so that we would not be seen if anyone passed along the road. The chances of this were slim. Most people who came to picnic at the park arrived early, and if they weren't there, they probably wouldn't come. If they went to the park after work, they didn't arrive until three or so, which gave me more time than I needed to get it done. I extended my hand, and he put the phone in it. It was a different iPhone than the one he had yesterday. Mr. Sly must have had more than one phone. I asked Brett to undress to make sure he didn't have any recording devices or cameras. I chose our location at random to make sure he hadn't set up cameras there in advance. Okay, do it, I said. What to do, he asked. He got nervous. This time it's just blackmail, pure and simple, just like yesterday. I don't want to have sex with you. You don't force me physically, but you force me to do things I don't want to do. No, he said, shaking his head. There is no force here, and there is no blackmail. You want what I have. I named the price. You agreed. Do it, I'm leaving. Give me my phone. Okay, Brett, I said. I just wanted this nightmare to end so I could erase this mistake from my memory and move on with my life. I could see this ring on my finger. My mom only had one carat diamond in her ring, and it was gorgeous. Let's just do it and get it over with. He smiled and reached out to me. I really wish it didn't get so ugly, he said. We are very similar. We both like excitement. We could arrange this without your boyfriend ever finding out or getting hurt. This should never have started, I said. It was a mistake from the very beginning. You're just tricking me into doing something I would never do for you otherwise. So let's get this over with. Yesterday it wasn't like that. Yesterday I was stupid, I said. I didn't behave like a grown woman. I didn't think about how it would hurt the people who love me. It was like a game. He looked at me strangely. It was clear that some of my words reached him. How do you think your wife will feel when she finds out what you're doing? I asked. So let's finish, I said. I agree. 
I need to start rebuilding my life. While he was waiting for inspiration, we heard the sound of a passing motorcycle. So many cars passed by without turning that we didn't pay attention to the biker. Well, let's limit ourselves to what we started with yesterday, he said, and we will consider that everything has been settled. We were both so focused on what we were doing that we didn't notice that more than one motorcycle wheel had passed us and that they had parked. In fact, we didn't notice anything until we heard voices behind us. I'm next, said a rough voice. Then I, said the other, I told you that I saw her here in the park yesterday. I only saw her from afar. I didn't know she was so cute. I was shocked. No one had ever talked about me like that before, especially right in front of me. So this is your old woman? asked one of the bikers. No, Brett and I answered at the same time. Well then, you don't mind if we borrow it from you a little, do you? asked the big guy. Um, I don't, Brett began. Well, it's like you don't have a choice, the biker said, and I wouldn't want to beat you up in front of your girlfriend. At that moment I laughed. Brett is an MMA fighter, I said. He'll blow you apart. At that moment I heard someone break through the bushes, and Brett disappeared. He left behind his pants and even the phone I was looking for. I left his pants on the park bench and picked up the phone. You don't need a phone, girl, the big biker said. I'm not really like that, I said, my voice shaking. This asshole had a video on his phone and he was blackmailing me with it into doing it. Of course he was blackmailing, said another biker. Just look at the phone, I said. I turned on the phone and went to the page with the video. Then I selected the video and pressed play. Both men looked at the video and started laughing. The big deal is where we're going. There's a lot of guys who will entertain you. He grabbed my hand and pulled me towards his motorcycle. I kicked and screamed, but there was no one in the park to hear me. Finally, the guy got tired of my resistance and just hit me. He didn't knock me out, but he knocked all the desire out of me to resist. I have never received such strong blows in my life. He told me to get on the motorcycle, and I did. I would do everything to avoid such a blow again. I was still so dazed that I could barely hold on. After we got around the block, he got off the bike and sat me in front of him so he could support me. We arrived at a house that was less than six blocks from the park. I knew exactly where we were going when we arrived on the street. He dragged me up the stairs to the bedroom, where there was only a dirty mattress on the floor, and slammed the door. I have never felt such fear in my life. After he slammed the door, I realized that he had taken Brett's phone from me, but not mine. I texted Becky, in trouble. The bikers took me away. Large house near the park. Call the police. Hurry. I sent the same message to Julie. I left my phone on and put it back in my pocket as soon as the door opened. You weren't kidding, Bubba. She's a sweet little thing. She doesn't look like a slut, said another biker. This one was even larger than the first two and had a beard braided into a long tail. I'm not like that, I screamed. I was blackmailed. Big trouble will await you. They will look for me. He just looked at me and nodded his head. Then he handed me a bottle of beer. Take a sip, he smiled. It will make everything easier for you and help you relax. No, I said. He moved so fast that I didn't even see it happen. I silently prayed that Becky or my sister would call the police and drank my beer. They didn't lie. Almost immediately after it hit my stomach, I began to relax and feel better. I felt warm. I don't remember much after that. Not bad, Greg, said my boss, Bill Miller. You did a great job on this detail. You made it smaller so it takes up less space overall, but you also made it stronger so it will last longer. You were even able to keep the original manufacturer's whole locations. This will make installation easier. I couldn't ask for a better job from one of my full-time engineers. I hope you become one of them next year after you graduate from university. At that moment I was really happy. I was confident that the bonus I would receive this week would be more than enough for me too.
My thoughts were cut off there as I remembered the conversation I had with Jason the night before. I didn't like talking to Jason even though we were old friends because I knew what he was going through. In fact, as we talked about it, I got the impression that Jason had almost made up his mind. He was leaving town. I knew that Becky was somehow wrong, and I had heard rumors about her. But I never saw her do what people were talking about. When I got home, as usual, I was on the phone and about to call Penny when I noticed that I had a voicemail. I listened to it, and of course it was from Jason. I called him back immediately because he sounded very upset. After we talked for a few minutes, I realized that the latest rumors that were circulating around town were true. Becky broke up with Jason, as she had done three or four times in the past year. The pattern was that she would meet him and apologize to him after a day or so and everything would be fine. But this time, Jason wanted to know why and what the hell she was doing when they broke up, and he found out. He was crushed and decided to just walk away from her with his head held high. Later that day, Becky called him several times, and he did not return her calls. Jason worked at a hardware store next to the diner where Becky worked. He decided to leave work early so as not to run into her. Unfortunately, she decided to come early to talk to him because it wasn't like him to not call back. She walked up to him and started telling him some nonsense about how his behavior was the reason they broke up. He tried to ignore her and just walk away, but she kept talking and talking. Anyone who knows Becky knows that she can't shut up. Basically, she started talking about how she doesn't really understand why he even deserves a woman like her, but she has no choice because she loves him. And that's when something clicked in Jason's head, and he hit her. He told her she was right. He really doesn't deserve a woman like her. He treated her like a princess, despite the fact that they were talking about her throughout the city. He loved her more than she ever deserved and did everything he could for her. She repaid him by having sex with some stranger in the bushes in a public park. He told her to erase his number from her phone and never call him again because they were done. Around this time, Becky started telling him that it was just a rumor like everyone else and he should believe her. She loved him and would never do something like that to him. Whoever told him about this was just trying to keep them apart. Jason told her how she was dressed in the park before walking off into the bushes. He described what the guy she had sex with looked like and what his truck looked like. He even told her who was with her. Finally, he told her that he did not learn about the separation from someone trying to separate them. He himself followed her and saw everything with his own eyes. Becky started crying and begging him to forgive her, and that's when the police arrived. Jason then told me that he was done with Becky and instead of going back to college in the next town over where most of us went, he was going to transfer to a college in another state and start over. He needed to get away from Becky, and our town was too small to make a clean break. He would constantly bump into her and needed space. I wished him luck and told him that we would still spend time together in the summer. That's when he told me about Penny. He said Becky told the truth to the officer who took the report and wrote her a ticket but she told the officer that Jason was wrong. This was not the penny he saw. Jason told me that he was torn by this fact because, first of all, he didn't think Penny was that kind of girl. She was never with Becky during the rest of her antics, but in that moment he was sure it was her. He told me to never trust someone with my heart blindly because I could end up in the same situation as him. Trust but verify were his exact words. After I hung up, it switched to my next voicemail. It was from Penny. Usually, unless there was an emergency, she would wait for me to call her after work. She knew it was always the first thing I did. The next message was also from her, and her voice sounded anxious. By the third message, her voice had become desperate, and I had a bad feeling that I knew why. I knew there was someone I could trust to get to the bottom of this, but surprisingly I didn't know how to contact her. If I called my home phone, I would have a one in five chance of getting through to her. If her mom, her dad, Penny, or the answering machine had answered the phone, I would have been exposed and would have had to talk to Penny before I was ready. This was one of the advantages of living alone. 
I just ignored my phone all night and played video games. I decided the safest course of action was to talk to Julie first. Julie loved her sister, but she was also an honest and trustworthy person. She will tell me the truth, no matter what. I never thought about calling my little brother at my parents' house and asking him to ask Julie to call me. I guess I didn't want my brother or even my parents to know what was going on. If the feeling I had after talking to Jason was correct, it would be too embarrassing for anyone to find out that I, too, was a fool. So after a sleepless night, I went into town. I had another idea. I could stop at a diner and have breakfast. While I was eating, I asked Becky about what happened. I thought she would probably lie. She had just taken responsibility for her friend, but I could tell by her eyes when she answered me. Somehow I doubted that Becky could look me in the eyes and lie without any signs. Unfortunately, Becky was not in the diner. Mary Johnson, the diner's owner, told me that Becky called this morning and said she wasn't coming. Mary, one of the town's gossips, was sure that Becky had finally gotten what she deserved. She said Becky couldn't stop crying on the phone. So I ate and got ready for work. This brings me back to where I started. I wondered if I should even take the ring. After all, I paid for it, so I'll have to take it back. It'll probably just gather dust until I find someone else. As I walked back to the office I shared with the other interns, I contemplated leaving like Jason. Then I decided that I was judging the woman I supposedly loved without any evidence or support. Doesn't she deserve better? Just as I was thinking about this, my phone rang. I took it out of my pocket and received another call as soon as I said, Hello? Greg, this is Becky. We have a big problem and I don't know what to do. This is about Penny, Becky said, and you won't like it. Is this related to the guy she was making out with yesterday? I asked. Greg, I can't talk about this, she said. There are more important things now. Becky, if you can't talk to me, then goodbye, I said. I have another call. I'll call you back. As soon as I answered another call, Julie started talking. Greg, my stupid sister really got into trouble. She sent me a message. Wait, I'll send it to you. I read the text and shook my head. Have you called the police yet? I asked. Yes, Greg, she said. I called them first. The guy on the phone said the dispatcher had left the office but he would try to send the car there as soon as someone returned. There are few people in our city. Wait, Julie, I told her. I switched back to Becky. Okay, Becky, I began. Okay, we did it, she said loudly. I did it on purpose because I thought I could evade responsibility. I didn't think Jason would just give up on me. But Penny, it was just an unfortunate coincidence. She loves you. So how many times? I asked. Does it matter? She asked. Yes, it matters, I answered sharply. Including probably three times today, she said. But Greg, she really loves you. Becky, meet me in the park, I said. I think I know where this house is. When Penny and I first started dating, we would sit in this park for hours, just talking. After curfew, we drove around the area, and I remember a house that always had a lot of motorcycles parked in front of it. Did you call the police? After yesterday, no one in this town will take what I say seriously, especially the police, she said. Okay, I'll meet you in the park, I said, hanging up. Julie, did you call your parents? Um, no, she said. Julie, call your father and tell him what's going on. I'll find her. I said. Greg, do you know what she did and how it all started? She asked. Yes, Julie, I said. I didn't want to believe it, and I don't know all the details, but I do know that we are finished. I jumped into my Mustang and headed to the park. On the way, I called the police myself. When I first woke up, I was lying in bed. Looking around, I saw my family. None of them smiled. My mother held my hand. When my eyes blinked and let in the light, she looked at me. Penny, she said. Then her face contorted, and she let go of my hand. What the hell is wrong with you? asked my father. 
I ignored his question. I tried to sit up and noticed that I had a pipe in my hand. Where's Greg? I asked. Greg came for me. That's when it happened. My sister Julie crossed the room and slapped me in the face. My father had a hard time keeping her from attacking me. Dad, where is Greg? I asked. My father looked down. Darling, he said. But without even looking at me, he let go of Julie and she hit me again. I tried to defend myself from her blows and only tore the phone out of my hand. A security guard and a policeman entered the room and helped my father pull Julie away from me. I hope you go to jail, Julie blurted. The security guard, the policeman, and my mother led Julie out of the room. Dad, I saw Greg. He came for me. He fought for me. Brett. Escaped. I don't understand. Greg is not strong. Brett is a professional fighter. Why? I asked. Penny, dear, everything is bad. Greg is in terrible condition. The Cross are fighting for his life. I started crying. Why, Penny? He asked. I just don't understand why you did it. He looked at me as if he expected me to say something that would make this confusing situation make sense. It was surreal. We grow up looking to our parents for guidance, wisdom, and answers to the questions that really bother us. This time my father looked to me for answers. Did Greg do something to you, baby? He asked. Because if I live to be 200 years old, I don't think I could find a better guy for you to marry. I mean, you've always been my little princess. That's why I was stricter with Julie than you and I ever were. When you dropped out of college last year, it didn't bother us. Hell, we even breathed a sigh of relief because it meant we could save money. Plus, everyone who ever saw you together knew that you and Greg were going to get married. I nodded. I have to tell you that your mother was a little jealous of you. She walked into a jewelry store and asked Julie to show her your ring. She then started pestering me with questions about how a student was able to save enough money for a two-carat ring when she only received a one-carat diamond. I had to remind her that we had expenses at the time and were trying to save money. He smiled at me as he said this and brushed my hair out of my face. I explained to her that in your case, you are Greg's complete priority, so he can afford to spend all his money on you. Plus, Greg has a great summer job and is on the right track in his career. This is something your mom and I couldn't say. So tell me, baby, what did he do? He cheated on you, and you did it to get back at him. I shook my head. Is he one of those guys who treats you well in public? And then when you're alone, he gets aggressive, because I'll send him away next week if he ever laid a hand on you. No, Dad, I said. Greg, for that matter, is even more loving and gentle when we're alone. You know how he is. Do you remember why I had to buy a mobile phone? He still calls me as soon as he wakes up and right before he goes to bed. He treats me like a glass princess. I wish he could understand that I'm tougher than he thinks, but other than that, we're good. Then why did you do it? He shouted. Our family has become the laughing stock of the whole city because of you. Your sister received offers three times this morning on her way to work. You slept here for over 24 hours and everything went to waste. My boss asked me to take a few weeks off to attend to family matters. My father smiled sarcastically as he said this. What he really meant was that the distraction I brought into the office was bad for business. It was full of people stopping to see the father of the town slut. Penny, I'm a salesman and a very good one. But honey, my base salary is less than half my income. If I'm not out there selling products and meeting clients, I don't make much money. Your mom's job is more like a hobby than anything else. After taxes and everything, she probably cleans about a hundred bucks a week. This will affect us. Sorry, Dad. It is not my fault. I didn't want this to happen. Don't talk to me like that, young lady, he shouted. While you lay here, the rest of us had to deal with the mess you made. Nobody blames you for what happened to the bikers, but it was your behavior that preceded what happened. I refused to answer him and could no longer look him in the eyes. I guess they beat up the guy you were with pretty bad, huh? He asked. 
No, Dad, I said. He ran away and left me with them. I don't understand this. He is an MMA fighter. He never lost a fight. He's never been in combat, my father spat in disgust. He is not a fighter even once. He is a beggar. He is married to a woman who lives two cities away. While she goes to work every day, he has to look after their children. He arranged for his younger sister to look after the children in exchange for favors while he went out. Apparently, he is so unhappy with his life that he makes up fantasies and takes advantage of naive girls. He has very little power in his family life as he is supported by his wife, so he regains his self-esteem by becoming an adventurous and mysterious character, in your case, an MMA fighter. I sank even lower in the bed. That's what everyone in town is laughing at you about. They were already making fun of Becky for losing Jason, but we already knew what kind of woman she was. Nobody expected this from you. Another thing people hate you for is the beating Greg took for you. Even the bikers who beat him admitted that they had never seen anyone defend another like that. Half the town thinks he's a hero. The other half thinks he's a fool. I looked at him. Would you do this for your mother? I asked. My father looked at me, and I realized that he was telling the truth. I want to believe that I would, he said. But there's a lot to consider. First of all, of course, is the fact that what was done to him should have caused him to pass out from pain. Even the doctors don't understand how he was able to continue to rise. Any of his injuries should have laid most men down for good, but he kept rising. As much as I love your mother, I'm not sure I could do the same. You would, Dad, I grinned. You love Mom. But not if I knew she was cheating on me, he said with disgust. That's why they think he's a fool. Greg followed you, knowing what you did. I hope he wakes up because I really need to know why the hell he put himself through all this after you did this to him. I also want him to get better because he's a good guy. And whether you realize it or not, if Greg dies, we'll probably have to move, and your life, in particular, will end. Dad, this will settle down eventually, I said. I was sure Greg would pull through. He just has to. I can't do without him. My father looked at me stupidly. Honey, have you ever heard of the Internet? Your photos and news of what happened spread all over the world. People everywhere are waiting. Can't wait to find out if Greg will come to his senses. Do you really think this will just be forgotten? I didn't have an answer to this. Everything my father said only made my condition worse. Have you noticed that there are both a policeman and a security guard standing outside your room? he asked. The policeman is needed so that you don't try to escape. Why should I try to escape? I asked. I'm a victim. You are also accused, he said. What? I asked. Do you remember what Becky was fined for? He said. She must pay a $500 fine. In Becky's case, she did it out of the public eye. She was behind a hedge or something like that. You were in full view of everyone so the fine will be greater. You did it twice. You are also accused of what happened at home. They're trying to accuse you of being an accomplice in Greg's beating, because if it weren't for you, this would never have happened. Okay, I'm a criminal, I hissed. Now I understand why there is a policeman at my door. Why is there a security guard there? What can he do that a policeman can't? The guard is here to protect you from the policeman, my father hissed. The police in this city don't like you. The governor sent a team to investigate our police department following this incident. You know, we have a very small police force. Usually there are only six people on duty, with another six off duty. They work 12 hours and change monthly. When this happened, I had just arrived at the house, and the police were already on the spot. There were five of them there, and they wouldn't let me in. They told me that they would kill me. They said they called the state police and were waiting for them to arrive. Then that little policewoman rushed in with a gun. She called them cowards. They all just stood there, looking at the ground and calling her crazy. We heard one shotgun blast and then nothing. Cops said she probably took one of them before they took the gun from her and overpowered her. That's when the other motorcycles arrived and the police ran away. Penny, 
They got in their cars and burned rubber on the way out. I think they expected the second group of bikers to stand next to the first group. We found out what happened later when we talked to Terry. Who the hell is Terry? I asked. She's a cop, he said. She was the one who told us what happened inside, at least from the moment she got there. Dad, I'm tired, I said. I need to get some sleep. Darling, you've been sleeping for more than a day. The police are going to question you about what happened. What do you remember? He asked. They put something in the drink they gave me. I do not remember anything. He just looked at me and pulled the blanket over me so I could sleep. Over the next few days, I was interviewed many times. I saw therapists, profilers, police sketches, and people whose jobs I don't even remember. I told them all the same story, over and over again, until I got tired of hearing it myself. For a week, I asked several times a day if I could see Greg. I was always told that he had not yet regained consciousness. It got worse every day. Greg had three surgeries, but was still in a coma. Nobody told me anything about him except my father. After a week, I was allowed to return home, but I had to wear an electronic cord around my ankle, and an officer was assigned to our house. He mostly followed me around and watched TV, frowning at me. My father always talked to me, but things were different between us. I think it knocked me off the pedestal he put me on. My mother was polite, but she never looked me in the eyes. She also never touched me. I grew up in a home where we were always affectionate with each other. My mom used to come over to give me a hug and suggest possible chores to do around the house before going to work. It was a joke between us because she knew I wouldn't do it. I think my mom's refusal to hug me or touch me in any way hurt me more than what was happening. But nothing prepared me for the outright hostility in my sister's eyes. It was as if she was openly encouraging me to say something to her so she could attack me. I'm also not sure she would limit her attack to verbal attacks. I still remembered how she slapped me and had to be torn away from me in the hospital. My sister and I have always had an adversarial relationship. We were relatively close and I could count on her to have my back if I got into trouble, as she had done earlier during the roller coaster incident. But there has always been a hidden rivalry between us. My parents were to blame for this. I've always been the golden child. They practically gave me everything I wanted. Julie had to work for herself. When we first met, Greg started calling me day and night, so my parents bought me a cell phone so the house phone wouldn't be blocked, but also so they wouldn't have to get up to answer it. Julie asked them for a cell phone, and they tied it to her grades, which were always much better than mine, and her getting a job to pay the bills. But her hostility seemed to come from something deeper, I asked my dad about it and found out that Brian, Greg's brother, had succumbed to pressure from people in town and left Julie. They tried to make Brian look like a fool for dating the town slut sister. She'll probably kill him the same way I killed Greg. Brian tried to hold on, but he wasn't as strong as his brother and cracked under the pressure. I never thought that Julie cared as much about Brian as I did about Greg. I always thought they were just faking relationships in preparation for meeting their true loved ones, but what do I know? After nearly two weeks and five surgeries, Greg regained consciousness. He was weak as a kitten and stayed awake for only a few minutes at a time, and no one except my parents and my sister told me about it. I first found out about this when I overheard a conversation between my mother and my sister. They both went into the bathroom and closed the door. We had more than one bathroom in our house, so they didn't have to go in together and close the door unless they were hiding something. At first, I thought they didn't want my cop to know what they were talking about, but he was downstairs. Dad was outside. He tried to keep himself busy with housework to occupy his time since he could not go to work. This meant there was something they didn't want to let me know. I took a glass of water from my bedside table and placed it against the door. This trick really works. I heard Julie tell my mom that they were worried about brain damage, but that the swelling in his brain had gone down. They didn't think it would be necessary to cut out part of his skull to relieve the pressure. I almost dropped my glass when I heard this. 
Then I heard something that made me really angry. Julie told my mom that the evening she was there, he woke up for a few minutes, squeezed her hand, and said her name. I opened the door and faced them. My mom looked like she'd been caught with her hand in a cookie, but Julie just stared at me. The least you could do is tell me he's out of his coma, I said. Sorry, my mother said. Penny, your therapist doesn't think you should see Greg, Becky, or anyone involved until we have a complete file on your condition. Also, the fact is, dear, that you love Greg, don't you? Of course, I said. There is no doubt about it. Well, seeing him like that would probably hurt you. He has bruises on his face and swelling. One of his eyes is covered with a blindfold and the other is barely open. He has wires and weights attached to his legs and a huge plaster cast on his wrist. There was a hose sticking out of it so that the blood could flow out after the operation and... Mom, I love Greg, I tried. You know that in joy and in sorrow, I can handle it. I want to see him. I need to see him. My sister snorted derisively at my words. I looked at her and said that she could at least tell me what she knew about him. For what? She asked. I don't need to tell you anything. Besides, she said angrily, his visits are very limited. Currently, there can be no more than two people in the room at a time. Usually, this is a family member and someone else. His family is so kind that they allow us to visit him. One of them needs to leave and do something else while we visit. There is also a list of people who are allowed to visit him. She looked at me and smiled. I go there every day at lunchtime and in the evening after work. Besides dating Greg, I'm dating my cowardly ex-boyfriend. Most days when I get there, Terry has just left. My eyes narrowed then. I wanted to see Terry. I've heard too much about her. Well, I'm going to go there, I said. Seeing Greg won't hurt me. Even if I was injured, he saved me. Seeing him will make me feel stronger and protected. And Greg loves me, so seeing me won't hurt him. This will probably help him recover faster. Julie then let out an ugly laugh. You can't, she cackled. Why can't I? I hissed. To hell with the rules. He's my boyfriend, and I'm going to see him. Nothing can separate us. Neither the hospital nor his family can stop him from seeing me. If I have to stand at his window and shout to him as soon as he hears me, he will force them to let me in. I then realized that my relationship with my sister was seriously damaged. Her face showed how much she was enjoying herself as she told me the following. I don't know if her joy was a result of the loss I caused her with this incident, or if it was all because of those old differences in how our parents treated her. But Julie smiled as she plunged the knife into my heart. It's not the hospital or his parents, she smiled. Greg doesn't want to see you. Ever. The first part didn't affect me. But when she said Greg didn't want to see me, my knees gave way and the floor rose to meet me. Her last word, never, was drawn out and it almost sounded like a Doppler effect. It was as if her voice became deeper and slower as she formed syllables with her angry, emotionless lips. The next thing I knew, I was back in the hospital. My father was very upset with Julie, but my mother was hesitant. It was worse than I thought. My therapist thought the best thing for me would be to have a few short, easy conversations with Greg, who by this time was getting stronger every day. He was soon to have the patch removed from his left eye and was not scheduled for additional surgeries. He was allowed to start using a computer so he could take online classes and maybe even graduate on time. I received these reports from my father, who kept them brief and dispassionate. My therapist outlined a full treatment program that would be beneficial for both Greg's mental health and mine, including follow-up couples therapy to help us make sense of what had happened and hopefully become a strong couple with a good future ahead. I needed therapy to understand what I did and why. I also needed to make sure I was okay after this happened to me. Greg needed therapy to try to deal with his feelings about what I had done. And we both needed couples therapy to make sure we didn't have any grievances and to give us the tools to overcome them. It was a great plan and made perfect sense. There was only one reason for his failure. 
Well, I can't say it failed. We never started it. Greg refused to see me. By this time he had a lot of visitors, including people he barely knew, who just wanted to stop by and tell him how brave or stupid they thought he was. Greg was still Greg. Mentally, he was razor sharp. He had a computer in his room and would draw parts for his boss in AutoCAD when he was bored. There was no sign of brain damage or any remaining emotional problems that would make someone think there was anything wrong with him. But he absolutely refused to see me. My father visited him several times a week, and Greg was nice to him, even telling him not to worry. But every time my father even mentioned me, Greg's face darkened. Julie visited him every day. In fact, Julie and that police officer, Terry, were on Greg's family list. So if he had visitors and his limit was reached, one of them had to leave the room if Julie wanted to see Greg. I even tried to sneak in once, but the nurse on duty recognized me and wouldn't let me into the room. He will want to see me, I shouted. Maybe because of the desperation in my tone, she went and asked him. She came back a few minutes later and told me that I would have to leave. I tried to make peace with Julie, but it's very difficult to make peace with someone who doesn't talk to you. My father even told her to talk to me, but she refused. This was a precedent. Julie had always been a dutiful daughter, so even at 19 and as an adult, Julie refusing one of our parents was news. The next time I saw Greg was at an event. He was wheeled out in a wheelchair in front of the hospital. Julie was on his left and his mom and dad were on his right while Greg sat in his wheelchair. I heard a distant buzzing sound and the reporters and photographers who were there started taking pictures. Maybe I flinched or something, but when I clearly recognized the sound of motorcycles, my father took my hand. It's not them, my father whispered. These are the good guys, the bikers who saved you and Greg. As I watched, a car drove slowly down the block. As he got closer, I noticed it was Greg's Mustang. It was repainted. It came with some really nice chrome wheels. The car sounded more powerful and it felt like the interior had been redone. Behind the car were two lines of motorcycles. A woman who must have been Terry, although she was not in uniform, got out of the car and parked it on the other side of the street. She walked over and stood next to Julie, kissing Greg on the cheek. I got angry and my father squeezed my hand. It was a friendly kiss for the cameras, honey, he said. If you want to avoid jail before the trial starts next week, you need to calm down. Daddy, Greg doesn't even want to see me and he kisses other women in public, I whined. Several people in the crowd around us looked at me with displeasure. Then it started. The mayor stood up and made a speech. He gave Greg the key to the city. The governor gave a speech and announced that Greg Stevens' day would be celebrated across the state on Greg's birthday this year. Finally, the president's spokesman, who couldn't be there because he was out of the country, showed a video of the president talking to Greg and presenting him with some damn medal. Nobody mentioned me. Then all the motorcycles started their engines and set off. Each rider moved forward a bike length. One by one, the riders got off their bikes, walked up and shook Greg's hand. They then got back on their bikes and rode off. The amazing thing was the last three riders. They all stopped next to Greg together, rather than one at a time. The first one shook Greg's hand and spoke to him, like everyone else before him. The next man gave Greg a leather vest with the symbol of their motorcycle club. Greg smiled widely and told them that he would now have to buy a bike. The rider moved forward, but, unlike the others before him, did not ride away. He spent a lot of time talking to Greg and they smiled and he hugged Greg and then got on the back of the racer's motorcycle in front of him and they drove off. He left the shiny new Harley right in front of Greg. The bike was a gift and tribute to his courage from the bikers. They, like everyone else, respected Greg's bravery. Nobody respected anything about me. A couple of police officers turned the motorcycle over so Greg could get a better look, and the crowd went wild. For at least an hour, Greg sat in his chair, talking to people, hugging and shaking hands. Every time someone recognized me, they gave me dirty looks. 
The next day, I read every story I could find in the newspapers or on the internet. It was PR day. Everyone even remotely connected to the story used it to gain attention. The district attorney boasted that he would soon prosecute everyone involved. The mayor and governor used it in their campaign ads. Bikers even used advertising to claim that most bikers were law-abiding citizens like all other groups. There were very few who gave the rest a bad name, but most of the bikers were your next-door neighbors. The only ones who failed to benefit from the incident were the city police and myself. Our city's police force has been reduced from 12 to 4. All officers present during the incident were fired, as was the police chief. Several other officers who were called to help solve the problem but never showed up were also fired. Terry was suspended with pay for one day for disobeying orders and exposing himself to danger. This did not appear on her permanent record, but was included in the commendation she received for bravery in the line of duty. Until a new police chief was elected, our police force was led by a state police captain. All the fired police officers left the city. Most of them had difficulty finding another position in law enforcement. The trial began the following week. All the caught bikers agreed to plea bargains. I didn't have to testify. It was good because if it weren't for the two I met in the park and the leader with the braided beard, I wouldn't have been able to identify any of them. Warrants were issued for the arrest of those who escaped, but everyone doubted that they would ever be found. In a later case, I was charged with two counts of public indecency, inciting a riot, disorderly conduct, and malicious mischief. My fines, including reimbursement to the city for the resources spent rescuing me, totaled over $10,000. I had to make weekly payments and knew I would probably have to pay for the rest of my life. My mother assured me that she and my father would not pay. I needed to get a job as soon as possible. I ended up working at a diner with Becky. After the heat died down, Brian pulled his head out of his ass and begged Julie to take him back. They ended up getting married, which I never expected. I was happy for her. Mainly because it meant I wouldn't have to worry about her stalking Greg. I have nothing to worry about. Less than a year later, Greg, armed with his great job and his new engineering degree, married the city's new police chief. Terry, at 27 years old and 5 foot 1, ran unopposed and won a landslide victory. Julie was her maid of honor, and my mom helped plan the wedding. I wasn't invited. They built a beautiful new house on the outskirts of the city and were very happy. I had my doubts. First of all, Greg just didn't look at her the way he always looked at me, even though she was clearly head over heels in love with him. I also remembered the dream in which Greg and I were sitting on the deck and our little girl came up to us and told Daddy I loved him. My father finally found out why Greg was stalking me, even though he knew what I did. Greg has always been a decent person and planned to break up with me when he found out what I had done. Greg had to go after me because until he broke things off with me personally, I was still his girlfriend, so he had to protect me. In his opinion, it was that simple. Everything also continued for about three years. Eventually, my mom and dad came to tolerate what I did and started treating me better. Julie got to the point where even though she still wasn't talking to me, she was answering my questions, but she never forgave me. My mom constantly pestered Julie with questions about when she was going to have children, but Julie just never responded. Julie and I weren't that close anymore but I could see that she and Brian were having problems. When they came to the house, yes, I still lived at home. They were not as affectionate as one would expect. Brian suggested they see a marriage counselor. They had allegedly been trying to conceive for some time, so Brian underwent a medical examination. Brian turned out to be completely fine. Julie refused to go to the doctor. After months of Brian's begging and my mom's harassment, Julie finally gave in. My mom reassured her that most fertility problems could be solved, and Brian assured her that he would love her no matter what. The thing that scared me the most was when Brian said that. It seemed like it was meant to show that he loved her. In a quiet voice that only I could hear, Julie said, This is what I'm afraid of. So Julie got tested. 
she underwent a full medical examination. They drew blood and used endoscopes to examine her internal reproductive organs. The most revealing thing was the blood test. And Julie just didn't seem to care by then. I really think she wanted to get caught. Julie was declared completely healthy in reproductive terms. The doctor assured them that Julie could easily start having children. As soon as she stopped taking contraceptives, according to her doctor, Julie was taking a very strong dosage of one of the most powerful drugs. Brian was angry and upset. My parents tried to console him. They used everything they could think of. They told him that maybe Julie was just afraid of becoming a mother so early in her life. I remember Julie as a child, playing with dolls and dreaming of a husband and children. Julie and Brian's marriage did not last long after this. Brian was devastated. Julie seemed relieved. Brian moved out, and Julie continued to live in her apartment. I started occasionally dating a retired veteran who lived in a nearby town. He was about 50, and we were in a no-strings-attached relationship. His tender love, although it was not filled with love, but rather with friendship, reminded me of Greg. So I guess everyone lived their lives and were as happy as they could be until fate intervened. The hand of fate manifested itself in the form of a drunk driver who rammed Terry's car, killing her on the spot. The tragedy was that she was not on duty at the time. She was on her way to pick up the steaks that she and Greg were going to grill that evening. The whole city came to her funeral. I probably could have called myself a predator, but I saw this as an opportunity to arrange my life the way it was supposed to be. I stopped seeing my retired friend in the next town over and took a serious look at my life. I didn't want anything to come between us. Honestly, I couldn't think of anything like that. It was my desire for cheap thrills and entertainment that ruined everything between Greg and me the first time. I grew out of it, and when I looked at what cheap pleasures had cost me, I was ready for a boring life. I remembered how Greg fought for me, and I was ready to fight the same way to get him back. I looked on the internet to find out what is considered an acceptable waiting period. I didn't find anything specific. The shortest period was 24 hours. The longest was three years. There were people who quoted the Bible or other religious texts, while others used common sense. I decided to give Greg three months and then introduce myself to him again, just as a friend. I'll tell him that if he needs someone to talk to, I'm here. I was confident that the friendship would grow, and I was willing to take my time. Twelve weeks passed as if every second were a day. I cut my hair the way I wore it when we were together and started working out to lose a few extra pounds. I practiced the speech I was preparing to give him every day. When the three months had passed, I had actually only waited twelve weeks, which was a few days less. I was scared the first night. I decided to wait until the next day. It was exciting to see Greg again. The few times I saw him around town he seemed fine. He returned to work after a month, so I basically gave him two months to sit alone. I borrowed my dad's car, but didn't tell him where I was going. Dad knew that I went to the next town to visit my friend a couple times a month, and I guess he understood that we all have our needs. I was pretty sure he thought I was going there, and I didn't say anything to convince him otherwise. I parked down the road from Greg's beautiful house. Mentally, I began to plan what I wanted to change in it and in the surrounding area. In Greg's driveway were his original Mustang GT and another new Mustang, as well as another car I didn't recognize. Then I remembered that when we were together, Greg always talked about having a different car to drive in the winter so his Mustang wouldn't be exposed to the elements. I tidied up my hair and quietly knocked on the door. It seemed to last forever. The door opened and I was shocked. Have you seen the sign? You can simply leave packages on your doorstep. We were, uh, asleep. Her words trailed off and her eyes narrowed dangerously as she recognized me. My sister allowed the partially open door to swing fully open and she stood there holding a robe that barely covered her. She mockingly let it fall apart. I didn't care about Julie's bare breasts or her long blonde hair. 
I was wondering why the hell she was standing naked in Greg's house, less than three months after his wife died. There was nothing innocent in her large, naive eyes. I realized that my sister had just had sex, and she couldn't wait to get back to it. You're a damn bitch, I blurted out. A few seconds later Greg came to the door. He had time to put on his workout pants and t-shirt. Are these the auto parts I ordered? He asked. He looked at me, turned around, and walked away. What are you doing here? I asked. What do you care about? She answered. Because? I started, but then I burst into tears. Julie then did something I would never have expected. She grabbed my hand and pulled me into the house. He was wonderful. The decor was immaculate. The combination of ceramic tiles, parquet, and carpets was impressive. Julie noticed that I was looking around and said that the carpets were new in some places. This carpet is all mine. Terry and Greg only liked wood and tile. I almost didn't have to redo anything. Terry had great taste. She was a really nice girl. I was still in shock. But what are you doing here? I asked with tears. I was waiting for a suitable period of mourning so that... Don't be stupid, Penny, she said. Terry and I became friends during that terrible period in the hospital. We were both crazy about Greg. A relationship between me and Greg would be strange for many reasons. First of all, I was with his brother. Secondly, he almost died protecting my sister. It would just never work. I married Brian because I guess I hoped he would be something like Greg. And Brian is a good guy, but he's no Greg. They almost killed Greg in his attempt to protect you. But Brian left me as soon as people started calling me the whore's sister. I tried to get over it, but I couldn't. It was part of the reason Brian and I always seemed more like friends than lovers. When he started insisting that I get pregnant, I realized that this would be the biggest mistake I could make. He's a great guy, and I hope he finds someone who makes him happy, but I'm not his girlfriend. Terry knew Greg loved her, but he had trust issues for a while after what you did to him. She loved him the way Greg loved you. She only wanted his happiness. She always told me that if they ever broke up, I should rush to him with all my might. The day after she died, when Greg had to go through all her things, he found a letter addressed to me. I read it and then gave it to him to read. It said that if anything happened to her, I was the one who loved him almost as much. I moved in with him that day, and I know it seems strange to some people who know us and know our history, but it works for us. Greg loved Terry but it was more like two good people together. They had a terrible shared experience that bonded them, but there was no spark. Of course, you already know that the same thing happened between me and Brian. My sister gestured a lot when she spoke. This was not news to me. She's done this all her life. What was new was that a precious ring sparkled on her finger. Although I had never seen it before, my mother had told me about it, and I knew that Julie was wearing my ring. Well, the ring that was supposed to be mine. Terry was buried in her wedding ring, and it didn't look like it. Somehow Greg didn't give the ring to Terry, but Julie wore it like it belonged to her. But there was more to it than that. As I remembered my mom's story, Julie helped Greg pick out a ring for me, and she picked out a ring she wanted to have herself. Now she seemed to have both the ring she had always wanted and the man she had always wanted. I was more than angry but all my anger dissolved when I saw the look of determination and outright joy in my sister's eyes. Penny, I know you came here to try to get Greg back, and I don't blame you. The only reason I'm talking to you now is because I'm finally happy. For most of my life, I have always been in second place. Our parents put you first. You put Becky first. Brian even wanted to have children more to please his parents and mother-in-law than because he wanted to have them with me. Now I have someone who puts me first. Greg and I are both happy. I love him and he loves me. We create fireworks. As for you and Greg, he's happy too. And now that he's happy, maybe he can put the past behind him. Perhaps in time you will be able to sit down and talk. But let me warn you, we are both grown women now. All these children's games are left behind. 
I will fight for Greg as hard as it takes, and I will leave you behind. You and Greg were teenage sweethearts, nothing more. That ship not only sailed, but also sank. I should have told Daddy where I was going, I sobbed. That way he could have warned me. No, he couldn't, she said. He does not know. No one knows. But everyone will probably find out soon. Don't worry, Julie, I said sincerely. I may have been a terrible sister growing up, but I will keep your secret. She just started laughing and came up to me. I don't know why, but she always seemed to be the more mature of us, although not the eldest. That's not what I said, she said. She grabbed my hand and placed it on her stomach. Your nephew or niece is growing up here. In a few weeks, it will start to show noticeably, and then everyone will know. We're planning a wedding, but we're going to be like mom and dad, rushing down the aisle with a round belly. We'll hope to say I do before we become parents. When I looked at my sister, I saw that, unlike her marriage to Brian, she was truly happy. Moreover, Julie was glowing. I've heard of pregnant women having this kind of thing, but damn, my sister seemed lit up from the inside out. I thought about it and remembered the look on Greg's face before he realized it was me at the door. He was happy too. In fact, he looked at my sister the same way he always looked at me. Julie and Greg got married. The whole town was at their wedding, including Becky and me. Less than three months after the joyful event, my niece Cindy was born, and my mother was delighted. She finally had a grandson to care for. I don't know if Greg and Julie were joking when they gave the poor baby her grandmother's name or not. Fifteen months later, my nephew Tom was born. Mom told Julie that was enough, but Julie still had that look in her eyes. As a single aunt, I was always called on childcare duty when grandparents were tired or unavailable. I loved doing it. When Julie became pregnant for the third time, it surprised no one. She was upstairs in her bedroom, taking a nap. During her pregnancy, Julie did nothing but go to the toilet, sleep, eat, and kiss Greg. I was surprised that they didn't have more children. Over time, I had to accept that what they felt for each other surpassed what Greg and I had ever had. They couldn't even be in the same room without getting close to each other. If we had a barbecue and half the town came, it was still impossible to separate them. Even when the women got together to talk about girly things and the men talked about sports, women and beer, Julie positioned herself to always see Greg. It seemed that even when separated by a crowd of people, they were still the only ones that mattered. I realized that my sister, not me, was the perfect woman to share my life with Greg. She would never even dream of hurting him like I did. And while I never intended to hurt him, I wasn't strong enough to make sure I didn't put myself in situations that would lead to that. Julie could and did do it. I can imagine her in my place at the amusement park. That idiot Brett was coming at her with his cheap talk, trying to talk her into going on a trip. Julie wouldn't even talk to him with Greg in her life. Even today, having two children and pregnant with her third, my sister is still a beautiful woman, but men do not throw themselves at her. Maybe it's the look in her eyes, the polite but cold tone of her speech, the not-so-subtle way she shows off her big wedding ring that was supposed to be mine or the fact that she ends every damn sentence with my husband, but men just don't bother her. And that's a good thing, because I'm sure Greg would fight to the death for Julie. I sat in their beautiful room, which was both an indoor-outdoor sunroom, noticing that it looked a lot like the room in my dream of Greg and I, in the life I would never have. I smiled thinking about it because even though it wasn't true, it was one of my favorite fantasies, I never stopped loving Greg for a second. I just had to realistically accept that he would never feel the same way about me again as I felt about him. My retired veteran started talking about marriage. I wasn't sure if he loved me or just wanted to make sure I wasn't going anywhere. Either way, it's better than being alone. Then Greg came in, and for the first time since the incident happened, he sat down next to me and spoke to me. It was exactly that moment from my dream. Even what he said was the same. Penny, how was your day with the monsters? He asked, smiling at me. 
My niece ran past and casually said the same thing she did in my dream before she was born. Daddy, mommy loves you, and so do I. Tears streamed down my cheeks. The tears were bittersweet. This was clearly a sign of something. It was fate, or some forces moving the mechanism of the universe, telling me that everything was as it should be. Greg was where he was supposed to be, and the universe was fine. When I first had this dream, Cindy was my daughter and Greg was my husband. This was my ideal life. I lost when I was looking for cheap thrills and entertainment, so it went to my sister who truly deserved it. To sum it up, the cheap thrills cost me far more than I ever thought or was willing to pay. In the end, cheap thrills cost me not only the man I loved, but the life I wanted. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one. 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 Listening to the next one.